In this video, we're going to have a look at a couple of refinements or extensions, if you like, of steering behaviors. In particular, we'll explore the notion of path following, which is where we'll get our steering behaviors to move us along a path. And also after that, then the notion of constraint, uh, steering constraints, where we will want to, for example, to simulate something like a car, uh, which can't accelerate in all directions at the, the same um, overall strength. Rather, it moves at different speeds in different directions. So the notion of constraining or steering behaviours. But we'll start off first of all with um, the, the broad idea of path following. And make a distinction at this point. There's a distinction between path finding and path following. In fact, we'll, we'll spend a full lecture looking at path finding. That's where you don't know how to get from your current position to your target position, and you have to work out a path that will take you from your start point to your end point. Path following happens after path finding. Uh, there and path following, we assume that we have a path, that work has been done, and all we're interested here is using our steering behaviours to get an object to follow that path, to walk along it, so to speak, or to move along it. So it's actually an easier thing overall than path finding in most cases. Um, by way of getting a little bit of context around this, so, so there we've got a green line, you can see that's our path, and we've got a, a green triangle, that's the object that we want to, to go along it. Quite often if we imagine ourselves walking along a path, we'll imagine ourselves actually standing on the path, being part of it, and then sort of moving across its surface. That often will be the case, it's not necessarily the case. And you can see for the example down there that our green triangle is actually off the path. And this could uh, be the type of scenario where you have something that's moving at speed around, it has gone around a bend and it's skidded off. Uh, so because we want to do it generically, the first thing we're going to say is that for our object, okay, where is your closest point relative to the path? What path point do you map onto? So we'll map it onto a particular point. We'll then be concerned with moving and looking a certain distance ahead along the path. So we will uh, go to some particular target point, which is further down the path. And uh, we'll be using seek as our form of behaviour to move us along. So we will seek to the point that we have detected or determined further down the path. Um, if it's a path that has an end point, we might want to use a ride for that very last point if we want to stop down, uh, uh, to stop whenever we reach it. So it's, it's, a, it's a delegated form of, of seek. We're going to build upon seek and then delegate that child movement to seek itself. I'll show you a couple of algorithms. We'll start off with a non-predictive algorithm. This is one that won't try to take into account velocity and look further ahead. It's simply going to be concerned with whereabouts it is, but then let's pick a point further beyond. Um, so path follow is the name of the method. We're assuming that we're passing in here the object that is moving along the path and the path itself. A few slides time, we'll have a look at different ways in which you can define a path, uh, but there we're just assuming we have a class, don't care how the path is defined, we'll have a few methods for getting positions, uh, and, and that's what we'll be executing and calling here. We've got our path offset, and this is the notion of how far along that path we should look. Now, it's important to, to define what this is. So, for example, the path offset could span from zero to one. Where, um, or oh, sorry, the path rather. But if you think about the path, we, we could have the notion of position along the path. Uh, that could go from zero to one, zero meaning at the start of the module, and one meaning uh, at the start of the path, and one meaning at the end of the path. And there we might have a path offset of say 0 0.05, if you look one twentieth of the path distance ahead. Equally, uh, if our path was measured in terms of meters, we could have a path that is 800 meters in length, and our path offset may be 10. We look 10 metres ahead of where we're at, and that's where we're going to be seeking towards. Um, so these two things need to link up. The path has to have some defined notion of distance from start to end, and the path offset then is relative to that defined notion of distance. How far ahead do we look? Now, the first thing we do then is we want to work out whereabouts on the path is our particular object. So we're assuming that the path has a method get path position, and into that we can pass in uh, an xy position, for example, in two dimensions. In this case, the position of the thing that's moving along the path. And that method could be easy to implement, could be difficult to implement, depends on how the path is defined. It'll work out the closest point on the path to that object. And you can see there it's been returned as a, as a float, as a single value. 
So this gets into the notion if it is, for example, 0.5, say 50% along the path, or if we were in terms of meters, it might be 226, as in 226 meters from the start of the path. But it is, it is a position relative um, to our, our journey along the path. What we do then is we update it to give our target position. And that's nothing more than going to our current path position and adding on the offset. So if we were working on meters and we were 234 meters along the path and we wanted to look 10 meters ahead, it'd be 244 meters along the path is what our target position would be. Having done that, we then go to our path and we say, right, I'm going to give you in a, um, a, a path position relative to the walk along the path. I want you to give me out the actual location, the XY location of that particular uh, relative point. And we get that target position out, and that's what we seek towards. We say, okay, for that object, seek towards that particular target point, and we'll follow the thing um, along. Now we can improve upon that by taking into account the velocity, the movement of the object. And this is predictive path following. And that makes sense where you have, uh, let's say, a, a car or a vehicle racing around a track where it's going to be moving uh, at a certain speed. It may be slightly getting on and off the path depending on, on the speed at which it's moving. There it is useful not to look at where you're at, but where you're going to be and then to build that into the, the seek behaviour. So it predicts where the object will be in a short period of time and then maps that location onto the path. So it's, it's a one that better takes into account movement. Um, there's one other aspect looking into this here, which we will see in a second. So path follow in this case, passing the object, passing the path, fair enough. Passing the path offset, fair enough how far ahead we look. Uh, now we've got to look ahead time as well. So this will come into to the account of if I'm looking one second, half a second, how far ahead do I want to ponder where I'll be? And then finally at the end we have last path position and we'll see the need for this or a, a, the reason why we make these, this in the next slide. But this basically remembers where we were on the last time we called this particular method, where the last time we were on the path. So it tracks from one uh, call of this to the next just how we are moving along. So it's going to be a very, very similar method. First thing is we work out our future position. So it's based on our current position. Uh, add on to that the velocity we're moving at times the look ahead time. So that gives us our current point, move a little bit ahead in time based on our current velocity. Having done that, we more or less do exactly the same thing as before. We're getting out the path position and we're passing in our future position where we believe it will be. You can see in this one, we're also passing in last path position. And uh, you'll see in the next slide why we might need to remember where we were recently on the path to make sure that we're, where we're looking ahead, we don't skip any bits of the path over. Having done that, no change to before, we work at our target path position, we go back to the path and work at what position that corresponds to in our game world, and we seek towards that position, much the same as before. Now, predictive problems, this is the reason why it can be useful to take into account whereabouts we last were on the path. Um, if you look at the diagram at the bottom, you can see that we have our green triangle and it's just gone around a corner, it's getting around the corner. Um, we're projecting, so the arrow goes straight out the front is its uh, velocity and the dotted arrow that we see a little bit ahead is its predicted locations. That's where we think we're going to be in a short period of time. And that gives an issue because if we were to go to our path for our dotted triangle and to say, well, what's the closest point in the path? we might actually skip the big loop that goes up around the top and jump ahead to, to a bit that's close to me on this. So in that sense, it would might say, oh, you're, you're in that position on the path. We predict ahead and we get our seek output then down towards the, uh, the bottom middle of the screen. So in this case, because we have it looped together, because we were predicting ahead, we ended up jumping over a quite a sizable part of the path. If we wanted to do that, then one way to do that is by restoring and remembering the last path position. So you can see that down uh, bottom towards the left hand side. And because we know the last path position, we can have a range of current path locations, a range of locations we can meaningfully say that this is uh, the one that we're, we're going to map onto. Uh, and that helps constrain it to the path so we can't jump over bits. Useful in a lot of cases. Sometimes if you have things like being able to teleport about, it may not be as useful um, an aspect. 
How we represent a path, there's lots of different ways you can do this. Um, some of them are quite mathematical, where you can mathematically describe the path in terms of curves and, and different segments uh, and work out from that. There is a more simple way, and one I actually recommend works out very well indeed, is a list of points. And uh, there we have a curved surface, and you can see there we're drawing points onto that. And we'll draw points so that where we have curvature, we have more points. And where we have a straight, we have relatively few points. So to go from one point to the next point, you roughly go in a straight line. That's why if you, you look at the diagram where we have more or less on, on the straights, the points are far apart. But when we're going around corners, we have a higher density of points so that we can uh, notionally curve around. But it is a straight line approximation of a curved um, shape. But it, it works quite well. If you have that set up, in terms of implementing the two methods, working out the closest point and the next point along the line, they become quite trivial. Um, so the integer path position is defined as the index of the closest point to the source. So you can go through your, your list of points and work out which of your list of points is closest to the location of the character. Uh, that's your closest point. And if that is index i, then index i plus 1 is the next point, the next point you're following along the path. That determines where it is you actually seek towards. So it's a simple way then of being able to implement a, a path. And that's really all we want to say about path following. As mentioned, when we get on to path finding, uh, there we'll look at how we can actually build up and develop paths. So last bit of this is the notion of constrained motion. Um, so here we have a car. We know that a car can, can turn at a certain rate. Um, it can accelerate forward with a certain speed. It can accelerate backwards with a certain speed. The output from our steering algorithms, all of the ones that we've seen, it gives us a velocity, well, it gives us an acceleration, it gives us a velocity and so on. The acceleration, we, the algorithm rather, assumes you can accelerate fully in every single direction. And for a lot of objects, that isn't uh, going to be the case. Um, so we want to be able to, to model this within our, our game. Um, it says down the bottom, in order to realize movement requests, a motor control layer can determine how to best execute a request, a process known as actuation. So there we put in an additional layer that, that interprets what the steering behavior is outputting in terms of the capabilities of the object that's trying to implement that steering directive. There's different ways you can do it. Um, I'll show you two. One's filtering, and filtering is actually quite a straightforward way that works most of the time, but not all of the time. Uh, so here we have a car. Um, we've got some requested linear acceleration, so it wants to accelerate in that particular direction with the strength of the line that's shown. And requested angular acceleration, so want the car to turn around, um, again by the amount that's shown. Now, for the car, for the way that it is situated, it will be able to accelerate forward with a certain maximum acceleration and will have a turning and be able to turn again with a certain overall amount of uh, rotational acceleration. And what we simply do is that if I want it to accelerate, uh, in this case you look at sort of the x and the y axes, um, my requested linear acceleration will have something along the x, something along the y. I can't accelerate along the y at this point because I'm pointing along the x. So in this case, I'm going to ignore the y component. I'm just going to accelerate along the x component by the requested amount. Uh, likewise, for the requested angular acceleration, if it exceeds the maximum I'm able to do for the surface that I'm on, I'm just going to truncate it at the maximum. Now, it sounds crude, and it is crude. But if you are updating your, um, your filtering 10 times a second, then the car will move forward and will turn a little bit. And in the next update, it's going to be able to accelerate a bit more towards the direction and turn a bit more. So over several frames, it naturally will turn around and, and accelerate down towards uh, the target point. And it looks, generally speaking, quite good. Where you have problems is, is the example shown on the bottom, is where the, the requested uh, acceleration is in this case it's orthogonal, it's at right angles to the car. So we're, we're almost requesting the car strongly accelerates uh, to the right hand side and a little bit forward. Now initially we can't accelerate to the right, so we ignore that and we just accelerate forward, but a little bit forward. So there it won't look right. The car will move forward 
slowly and turn and it's only whenever it's turned around in a leisurely speed but then start accelerating strongly towards the the target so it's yeah it, it's not ideal uh, but it'll get you there unless you're perfectly aligned with your target uh, location again you can detect this based on the the magnitude of the the requested and then the magnitude of what is actually possible and you can put in, in place some special functioning to deal with it if you do want to use filtering um, uh, in terms of constraint motion filtering is one i would recommend if you want to be more fancy well here's a, an example of one that is more fancy and it's about the use of movement arcs uh, so we have um, three arcs you can see two of them at this point this is where the car is at rest and we have a front arc that encompasses most of the car and we have a rear arc um, that has a, a, a maximum distance associated with it and for the forward arc um, any point and uh, the forward arc extends out as far as it possibly can go I'm only showing a, a bit of the greenness here but really it's, it's of infinite length uh, so it doesn't matter whereabouts you are anywhere within the forward arc extended out if you are there then the car is going to accelerate towards you with maximum acceleration if you're in the rear arc so if you have a point that falls within the rear arc and again taking into account the maximum reversing distance so if you're in the rear arc and you're way 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 off then you'll you'll accelerate and turn around but if you're in the rear arc and within the maximum reversing distance then the car won't try to turn around it's simply going to reverse back towards the the target so this gives a kind of of cars deciding to go forward or to reverse where this gets nice is that as the car moves forward these arcs shrink and in the bottom you have sort of yellow arcs coming in these are braking arcs um, so then we have a green front arc a red rear arc uh, and that quite often can come back down to zero and uh, two uh, yellow arcs now whenever a target point comes in if it's within the green front arc then we still accelerate and move straight towards it if it is within the yellow braking arc then what we do in that case is different we actually brake the speed slows down and when we slow it down the actual arcs will shrink because they get bigger and smaller depending upon the speed so what happens there is the car will brake the arcs will shrink and as soon as it falls into the front or the rear arc then that will take over and that will then bring the car towards the the target so you get quite nice behavior where you will intelligently accelerate towards your target or reverse um, or you will brake as need be to slow the car down when you can then head towards the the target um, and again there's lots of more sophisticated things you can do beyond this if you really wanted to have a proper um, sort of driving uh, model within your, uh, your, your, your game but beyond the scope of this course so overall key takeaways on this um, steering behaviors can be used within uh, used with a path prediction algorithm to provide a path following behavior um, so we can given a path we can follow that path using our basic seek behavior with a little bit of uh, path prediction moving along and by constraining the steering output it's possible to provide physically plausible constrained movement so if we wanted to simulate a car or a motorbike or something like that then we can put that in so that it it moves in the same sort of ways that we associate something moving in the real world and that's really all we want to to say about our steering behaviors um, they're very very flexible there's lots of different things you can do with them we've touched upon quite a few but really are only scratching the surface in terms of their their, their full extent but hopefully um, a lot of useful stuff you can incorporate now within your your game development